to this webinar this afternoon. Um, as you can see, the topic really is around the professional's responsibility in promoting accountability and ethical leadership. So a few housekeeping rules to begin with. Basically, if you have any questions, then feel free to type them in the chat. All questions should be typed in the question and answers function. And any comments um, can be typed in the comment section. And just so you know, you won't be able to read each other's questions. And if you still want your question to be anonymous, if you wish it to be like that, um, then you may click on the question to be anonymous. And then a little bit about our presenter this afternoon. I think she actually needs no introduction. But having said that, our Auditor General, Sakani Maluleke, who will be giving opening remarks and a short presentation, uh, basically to, to tell you a bit more about her, Ms. Sakani Maluleke is South Africa's Auditor General. She's the first woman to hold this position and it's in a 109 year history that she has this. She was also the first female deputy auditor general. I'm gonna pause there and mention that I was at a conference when she was uh, filling in for the auditor general at the time as a deputy. And that was the first time that I had actually personally met her. Her background as a chartered accountant spans for more than 20 years with experience in both the private and public sectors and in areas as diverse as auditing, consulting, corporate advisory, development finance, investment management, and skills development agencies. Sakani served on the Presidential EE Advisory Council, where she successfully led a subcommittee that developed recommendations for broad-based Black economic power empowerment. As chairperson of the CA Charter Council, she led the first BE sector charter, which focused on key transformation initiatives that improved access for black people to enter the profession. As a non-executive member of the Financial Advisory and Intermediary Services Ombud Committee, she advised the setting up of the FACE Ombud Office. Sakani's career is motivated by a passion to actively contribute advancing black men and women in the accountancy profession. She has pursued this passion through her work with various organizations, including Business Unity South Africa, African Women Chartered Accountants, and the Association for the Advancement for Black Accountants of Southern Africa, ABASA, of which she has been the past president. Her current role as the SICA, South African Institute of Chartered Accountants, non-executive chairperson of the board, is a continuation of this work. Her commitment to service excellence and ethical leadership and her contribution to transformation has been recognized and awarded by the presidents of ABASA, AWCA, and Black Management Forum. Sakani is a fellow and moderator of the African Leadership Initiative and the Aspen Global Leadership Network. On this note, I hand over to you Sakani Maluleke to give some opening remarks as the Auditor General of South Africa. Over to you Sakani and a very warm welcome we are really delighted to have you on this webinar this afternoon and I have to mention that this webinar is also in honor of the WIT Centenary Campaign, where WITS this year is going to be 100 years old. So on that note, over to you, Sakani. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, it's wonderful to see you again and to, to be part of this webinar. I'd like to greet all the honored guests and the alumni of WITS. Um, you mentioned, Prof, that this is a 100-year celebration of WITS. So here's a tidbit. My grandfather went through vets many, many years ago, back in the 1950s, and qualified as a doctor through Vets University. So I feel like I own a little bit of your 100-year history. 
Um, and warm greetings to the students and the administrative staff of this. A good afternoon. It is a great privilege and honor for me to speak to you this, this afternoon about two subjects that I hold very close to my heart, accountability and ethical leadership. Prof, we meet this day being a day after our country commemorated Human Rights Day, 62 years since that historic protest against past laws. On this day, 69 people were killed and many others were injured when police fired on a peaceful crowd of protesters. They paid the ultimate price so that we could at attain our democracy. And many more South Africans also sacrificed so that we could enjoy the fruits of freedom as we do today. And of course, we all know that with freedom comes responsibility. Our democracy can only flourish and fulfill the noble aspirations and dreams of those it is meant to serve, citizens, when it is backed by accountable, ethical leaders and by good governance that does deliver quality services. To achieve the developmental objectives that are enshrined in our constitution and expressed in our development blueprint, the National Development Plan, that requires our best collective efforts as a nation, all of us, collective. Those of us who are professionals and stewards of public institutions have an even greater responsibilities in my view, because we have unique influence, reach, access and privilege and with all of that comes greater responsibility. We've been handed this, this, this democracy to build, to protect and develop for the benefit of future generations. It is a responsibility that we dare not fail and one that our conduct must reflect as we carry out our daily responsibilities and obligations, regardless of where we choose to ply our trade. As the Auditor General, I represent the Chapter 9 institution that is tasked with supporting our democracy through the auditing of public funds. And this asserts a responsibility to meaningfully contribute towards building a capable state, one that's characterized by capable institutions that are consistently and effectively fulfilling their mandate in a way that's transparent and one that's accountable. Democracy comes from the Greek roots of demos, meaning people, and kratos, meaning power, or force, or mind. Thus, since the days of ancient Athens, the, the strength of democracy has come from the might of the people. Today, by the light of that accountability and democracy shine on each other, I hope to illuminate the role that we as professionals ought to play in strengthening the foundations of our society. We must always remember that we undertake the responsibilities we're given as professionals, both in the public and the private sectors, for the benefit of the people of our country. As the HGSA, we've set for ourselves, together with the executive team that I lead, we've set for ourselves a very noble and ambitious goal, which is that we want to ensure that the work we do reflect and also impact positively the lived experiences of the citizens of South Africa. Simply put, we are challenging ourselves to increasingly put the interests of citizens, the interests of the public, the interests of society at the very center of what we do. As the world seems to be finally getting a handle on the COVID-19 pandemic, there is some optimism that we may be, way, we may be getting back to, to some normality. But as we look towards this normality, um, which will be different, I suppose, we must take some lessons that we've learned over the last two years, both in the private and the public sector. The pandemic exposed some of the best that humanity has to offer. We've seen how we were able to respond in the midst of a crisis. But it's also exposed some of the very worst, as governments around the world working with communities struggled to save lives and livelihoods. In our own country, and as shown up in our special reports that we conducted in, in the context of COVID-19, where we looked at the uh, government's programs to respond to the, the, the national health crisis, as well as the social and economic relief requirements. What we saw were things that were very similar to what we would have seen in our normal annual regularity audits. We were honored 
just to take a step back, we were honored to be asked to conduct real-time audits on that 500 billion rand package, relief package, right? And what we set about doing was to conduct real-time audits, which are something very different from what we had done before, but it was essentially building on the things we've been doing in the past. The outcome of our work, unfortunately, we will say that didn't surprise us. We found that there were still weak control environments. There were still instances of outdated IT infrastructure and poor data, data, database management, which could not support the work that needed to be done in that quick fashion. What may have surprised us, however, was the intensity of the opportunism that we saw, both in the public and the private sectors. So we often ask ourselves at the audit office and challenge our compatriots to also ask themselves, what is it that drives this level of opportunism amongst us as people? Is it because corruption tends to be seen as a victimless crime? Do those involved perhaps have a sense that there will be limited consequences if indeed they are caught? And do they bank on the notion that the prospects of, of them being caught in the first place are pretty low? And if so, I think it's important that we begin to realize that corruption is both a cause and a result of poor governance. It, it, it imposes steep costs on society as it holds back economic and human development. I'm acutely aware that corruption will occur in environments where there, there is good governance that I'm aware of and, and the stories that we, we can read from different parts of the world will bear that out. I just believe that our role as professionals is to be ever more vigilant and to blow the whistle on instances where we do see wrongdoing, regardless of who it touches, so that those that are responsible can be held accountable. Because that's how we're going to start changing this notion that we've normalized corruption in how the public sector runs. Any funds that are diverted into the pockets of an un unintended recipient have a very real effect on the intended recipient who then goes without the school lunch, goes without access to a bed in a public hospital, and goes without a social grant payment, a much needed social grant payment. With a shrinking public purse, increasing dissatisfaction with the state of governance and service delivery, with rising unemployment and poverty, and greater demands on the state to meet the needs of citizens. The time has come for us to collectively take much greater responsibility for the mandate that we are given to serve. And, I'll, and I want to emphasize once again, the use of the word collective. And it, it, for, to my mind, it doesn't really matter whether you sit in the public sector or the private sector. It's really about a collective drive to push back on, on what we are seeing now. Now more than ever, I believe that we must strengthen accountability, we must act ethically, and we must ensure good governance for the sake of our democracy. It's increasingly important that we begin to see consequences where there's been maladministration. And perhaps then we'll be able to start taking this notion very seriously of cleaning up our government institutions, right? And rebuilding the strength of these institutions. Corruption and maladministration are a global phenomenon, we know, which occurs at an astonishing scale. The World Economic Forum reports that were published following the release of those Pandora papers late last year. They estimate that global corruption now costs approximately a trillion US dollars every year. For us in South Africa, the issue may be even more closer to home. The recently released Zondo Commission reports have been sobering and startling. And I believe they should really be jolting us into collective action and action towards doing the right things, towards really saying and showing that this should not continue, not on our watch, not in our name, and certainly never again. We know from the years of testimony and the hearings that public entities across all levels, whether it was the, the, the local government sphere, the provincial government sphere, the national government sphere, municipalities, SOEs, right across the spectrum. We know that 
a number of government institutions served as the primary vehicles through which many of the nefarious activities were conducted. We know too of the involvement of many private sector companies in these activities. We know of professionals who not only acted as participants, but in far too many instances as key enablers in the misuse of state funds for private gain. At the center of these acts are professionals, people like you and me who have chosen to benefit themselves narrowly and individually instead of the citizens of our country, the poor and the most vulnerable in our society. These professionals chose to betray their duty to society and rather acted unethically and failed to be accountable. And it's hard to say with any certainty just how much corruption has cost us as a country, given the scale and the scope of these activities. However, we do have a, a figure that comes to us through the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants, SICA, which commissioned a study with Stellenbosch University and they looked at the depth of corruption in South Africa. The figure they came up with was one and a half trillion rand, which was lost to our country between 2014 and 2019. Now to put that in, into perspective, this is money that could have been used to fund our growing and ever urgent developmental needs. So clearly state capture has significant ramifications. It has a direct impact on the lives of all South Africans. The American investor, Charlie Manga, once said that in a democracy, it often takes a scandal to trigger reform. He was referring, of course, to the collapse of Enron in the United States. Following that, we saw the development and implementation of tremendous shifts in the governance of companies, including the, the uh, promulgation of Sarbanes-Oxley Sarb Act, which was passed by Congress to combat corporate fraud and failures. And yes, the pendulum may have swung too far, but at least there was responsiveness in the system. Now, prof as professionals, I believe that we should not only be asking questions, but we should also be looking to answer to the call for us to implement corrective action. Whilst our actions may not be the perfect solutions, but we ought to be seized with finding sound solutions and implementing corrective action. As for the National Audit Office, which I'm privileged to lead, we've been empowered in law through the amended Public Audit Act, which came into effect in 2019. The amended, amendment to the Public Audit Act introduced the concept of a material irregularity which was born out of the continued failures by accounting officers. And here I'm talking about the DGs, the heads of departments, the municipal managers. The failure of these appointed stewards of public institutions, but for them to address the audit findings that we were tabling year after year. And so these amendments and the powers that they granted us essentially are an instrument for us to influence and to enforce change change that society yearns for, and one that should influence better outcomes and ultimately better governance and stronger public institutions. It's not a system that's designed to be punitive as many think about it. Uh, it is a system that's designed to encourage accountability and clean governance. These can only be achieved if the corrective preventative controls or rather the checks and balances are put in place to prevent losses, wastage, and any wrongdoing with public funds. The MI process works similar to the reportable irregularity process in the, public, in the private sector. And essentially, I'm quite sure that even private sector auditors would agree that the best thing that anyone that's charged with running an institution can do is to put in place strong controls so that you limit the risk of things going wrong in the very first instance. And that's what we're talking about when we say, it's one thing to chase different material irregularities, but probably more urgent and more impactful is for us to strengthen internal controls in public institutions. The amendments don't empower us to take people to jail or put people in orange overalls, sadly for some, not for us. Um, but rather, as I say, they are complementary 
mechanism for us to encourage and enforce corrective action where controls have failed. And, and this action, as you would appreciate, being, an, being something that comes out of, an, out of an audit, comes after the fact. So we're not there when controls are being designed and implemented. We are not there when transactions are happening. Even if we audit in real time or just after a transaction has happened, we can only look at matters after the fact. So we still rely on accounting officers to put in place the type of controls that strengthen their own institutions. Just by way of definition, so the MI process, which is meant to address any non-compliance or contravention of legislation, any fraud or theft or breach of fiduciary duty, which we pick up in our audit, and we would have to look whether or not it has the, the likelihood of causing financial loss or it has already caused financial loss. We'd also have to look at whether or not it causes harm to the public or harm to a public sector institution or even loss of a material public resource. So we would have to look at impact. So there's the non-compliance, which is the audit finding, and then there's also the, the, the impact that we would have to look at. Over the three years that we've been implementing this, this instrument, we have raised 237 material irregularities. And all of these are currently in different phases of being processed in a way that's consistent with our law. And just to pause a little bit to explain how it works. Once we've identified a material irregularity, ours is to notify the accounting officer and then give them the opportunity to act because that's quite important. For we do not run the public sector institution. Ours is to give the notification to the appointed steward of that institution and give them the opportunity to act on our notification. It is only if they fail to execute their duties as given in law that we would then step up into implementing our, our powers, starting with referring a matter for investigation. And when that investigation comes back, we would give a recommendation of what needs to be done. If that still fails, we would take binding remedial action. If that still fails, then we would go towards issuing a certificate of debt. We're often, often criticized for taking too long with this, but I map out the process to demonstrate two things. One is that it does take time. The process is designed to give the accounting officer every opportunity to act in accordance with their given duties. It is only if they fail after multiple opportunities, if they fail to do that, that we end up with the certificate of debt, which is issued in their name. So far, we have issued our first four remedial actions um, to one to PRASA, the Passenger Rail, Rail Agency of South Africa, the Department of Defense, and two to the Free State De Department of Human Settlements. The remedial action um, essentially is the penultimate step before we go into the process of issuing a certificate of debt. We're very clear that if accounting, fails, accounting officers fail to implement what's required, then we will not hesitate to issue a certificate of debt. The good news is that in the vast majority of instances, accounting officers have proven to be quite responsive. When we issue the MI notification, they do respond and they do take corrective action. It, is, it remains our view that that should be the type of responsiveness that then is seen right through all of their duties during the course of the year beyond the audit process. Our office, I wanted to just talk about one last thing before, before I wrap up properly. Um, in, in the journey of professionalizing the, 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 the public sector, which I'm sure many people on the call would have heard about, uh, our office has formed part of the ministerial task team that's been working on the relevant documentation around it and designing um, how the public service can be professionalized because we do need to professionalize how public sector institutions are run. Make sure that they are headed up by individuals who are ethical, who are competent and who are accountable. For if we do not do that, then we'll never make any significant or sustainable gains in the journey towards building capability for the state. So we're very proud that we've been able to contribute to the journey of um, putting together this, this framework. One of the key parts of the framework deals with the, the professionalization part of it. And we've looked at the code of conduct 
that applies to accountants and auditors. And we've been able to infuse some of those lessons around how professional accountants the world over are charged with acting in the public interest. And we believe that this principle ought to apply to professionals, accountants or not, public sector and private sector, but professionals right across society ought to be seized with this question of how do they serve in the public interest? How do they insulate themselves from acting merely for the narrow interests of a particular client, but rather be seized with serving society in its breadth, ensuring that the work they do ultimately adds value into society. Um, I want to conclude uh, so that we can get into the question and answers by suggesting that there are three ways that we can adequately, adequately implement so that we can deal with the challenges we face if we look at the public sector in particular. The first of these ways, I believe, is by entrenching capable leadership. The second is by building capable institutions. And the third, perhaps the most important, is to put in place a culture of consequence management, of accountability for wrongdoing. So capable leadership, capable institutions, and consequence management. And I'd like to believe that we as a society are capable of fixing things and that we are capable of renewal and also that we're capable of greatness. I'd also like to believe that we are capable of recognizing our duty, private or public, to act responsibly and ethically in everything we do, that we, can leave behind us the era of self-enrichment and corruption, and that we begin again as one to serve for the greater good. Prof, we can no longer be bystanders. The very future of our country is in our hands. This is the democracy that we inherited, that so many sacrificed for us to benefit from. So thank you very much for allowing me to share some thoughts on the things that are so close to my heart. And I do hope that they've triggered some questions that can then drive the conversation as we go. Back to you, Prof. Thank you so much for that, Sakani. Absolutely well articulated. I must say I'm sitting here with full admiration for you to take on this challenge and to articulate it so beautifully. I'm going to start straight with the questions that are coming through the chat already. And then if there's time, we can go through a few general questions. So the first question, so many of these questions are from Dalpat Naran. I think as you were speaking, he just kept saying, what next, what next? So I'm gonna take the questions exactly as he's asked them, okay? So the first one is why are municipalities not achieving unqualified audit reports? Thank you, Prof, and thank you, Dal Partner. Um, a number of municipalities in, in different parts of the country struggle with the very basic. So let, let's start here. So far too many of them don't have capable leadership at the helm of the institution starting with the municipal manager and the CFO and the teams that they lead. They also struggle to ensure that the full senior management band, not just the CFO, because you know that an audit process doesn't look at things that the CFO does only. It looks broader than that. So if you don't have a senior management team that's aligned about the importance of maintaining records, putting in place proper controls, um, using internal audit to full effect, getting the audit committee to support them during the course of the year. You then end up with a situation where when we arrive for audit, the trial balance doesn't balance and is being put together right at the end of the year, which never works. The records that should support what's sitting in those financials that are submitted for audit, those records are inadequate. Um, there's no one available to respond to audit queries because either the, the people that were there during the course of the year are no longer in those roles because of instability, um, or they're just not up to the task. There then tends to be far too much of a reliance on consultants 
for consultants to put together financials and to respond to all the queries. Now, if you're a consultant who gets appointed at the end of a financial year, you really have little chance of having credible responses to all the queries. So in a nutshell, we believe that it starts with capable leadership um, from council level that's going to be seized with appointing professional staff to lead the institution, starting with the municipal manager, CFO and other senior managers, give them space to do their jobs and then hold them accountable. And you also accept that there are no short-term solutions. There are no quick fixes to this thing. If you don't have the basic disciplines during the course of the year, an audit at the end of the year is not going to help you. Um, so in far too many instances, it's really the leadership and the continued attention to these basics. Thanks, Akani. So this sort of, I think you've already answered, but I'll read the question from Dalpat anyway. Is the public sector employing competent staff in the finance units? The HR units must take more responsibility in the recruitment process. So I would say you've indirectly already addressed this to say it is about the whole uh, chain and it's not just the CFO. And then I'm going to go to another question also from Dalpat that says that most of the irregularities are predominantly conducted in the supply chain units. Again, HR needs to take some responsibility in the selection and recruitment. So I think, Sakani, that's like a common question I think many people on this call would have, is that we do see a lot of it is in the supply chain, chain units and the procurement specifically uh, where a lot of this happens. So maybe if you can tell us a bit more about that. So what we're finding is that the need to professionalize how supply chain is managed has never been more urgent. And by professionalizing it, I'm referring to making sure you hire people who are skilled, who are, are principled and ethical, and who subscribe to a code of conduct. Because you know, I mean, if you've got somebody who's a professional and belongs to a professional body, there is a higher bar for them to reach in terms of their behavior, in terms of their competence. So we've got to make sure we invest in it. And I'm pleased to see that the, the professionalization framework deals with that as well. We've got to professionalize how supply chain management is run across all of the procurement sites in government. We've also got to worry about the, the, the IT and the systems that underpin how procurement runs. Um, the more manual it is, the more susceptible that system is to, to interference and to manipulation. And of course, you can never ever over, over emphasize the importance of proper monitoring. Um, you know, what I've learned over my time in the audit office, and I've been here for a good nine and a half years, is that there's no recipe to, to this thing other than having a, an accounting officer who has tenure, who has the, the stability in their role to build a capable team, um, to build the type of disciplines about what it takes to run an institution, to, to be clear about the type of culture that should um, inform how things are done in that institution. And that takes time. You've also got to have an accounting officer that uses internal audit to good effect. I think all of us ought to be asking the question, if the AG comes year in and year out with the same audit finding, where is internal audit? Because every single public institution has an internal audit function. It's a requirement in law. And the question has got to be, why is it not effective? Because if, because they're there during the course of the year, the AG comes only once at the end of the year. Where's the audit committee that's supposed to inform how that internal audit function operates? And if you don't have an accounting officer that understands how all these pieces hang together and support him or her in fulfilling their duties, then you really have little chance of getting those disciplines, that culture. Yeah, thanks, Akani. So I think you've also indirectly answered another question of Delpert, but I'll read it anyway. So performance audits, why is value for money not a primary factor to be considered when awarding contracts? Poor service delivery from service providers must have consequence management internally and externally. So I would say you have covered that even in your talk about 
trying to get the consequence management. And I think, Sakani, that is pretty much what, you know, the, the sort of general public tends to feel, you know, that there, there's such mismanagement and are we really getting value for money when all of this happens? Yeah. Then there's two questions by Noshina Mansur. I'm going to read them both and then give you the opportunity to respond. What role do you see professional bodies playing in terms of ensuring professionalization and accountability of professionals? And then the second one is, will the World Bank 2013 ROSC report be taken into account when considering the professionalization of the public sector? That is, will all accounting professional bodies be regulated? Hmm. Um, thanks, thanks, Najina. The professional bodies play a significant role in making sure that there is competence in the area where they have jurisdiction and ongoing competence through the uh, continued professionalization and continued prof uh, professional growth uh, and, and, and CPD programs, right? They also have a, an important role to play in advocating for an environment where the people that are their members operate. Because if you've got um, a professional body and its members are mistreated where they work, they can the professional body can advocate for the creation of an environment where professionals can thrive and genuinely contribute. Mm -hmm. And the third and probably more important aspect is the code of conduct, because it's about the norms and standards of behavior that are expected of the members of that professional body, and they will have the ability to sanction members where things have gone wrong. So I do believe that if you've got professional bodies to which some of the key members of a management team within any public institution below, then you have competence and ongoing competence sorted out, then you've got advocacy dealt with, and you've got a code of conduct that's, that's enforceable, um, that can really help us to create a culture where professionals are able to thrive in the environment where they choose to work and they're held accountable when, when they do wrong. And then the last question about the last report, um, the, the professionalization story is really looking at the breadth of the skills that, that are required within a public service, not just accountants. But uh, as you know, the professional bodies that all accountants subscribe to have similarly adopted the IFA code on ethics, which calls upon all of us, doesn't matter whether you're a CA or a member of SIPA or ACC, it doesn't matter. If you're in the accounting profession and you hold a designation that is issued by any of the professional bodies within accountancy, you are required to act in the public interest. That's a very noble aspiration. And one I worry that we tend to forget. So Prof. Adia, if, if there's one thing I'm, I'm dedicated to ensuring doesn't happen again, is that we make light of this aspect when we teach the code of conduct. Um, I have the, the, the pleasure of working with a third of our staff who are in training. So the, the office of the AG has a staff complement of 3,600 people. A third of those are people who are in training much like any of the other private sector firms. In fact, we have the largest training scheme that's accredited by SICA. And one of the best things I'm able to do in my day is to spend time with these young people. And I spend a great deal of time talking about our public interest responsibilities as stated in that code of conduct. And I think if we all put that in the front and center of what we do, um, the world would get so much more out of us as accountants. Absolutely. So if it's any consolation, Sakani, we teach and preach ethics and the code till we blew in the face. And from where I think both of us sit, it's like, but this is not rocket science, right? Mm -hmm. It's you be ethical, ethical leadership, you be accountable, and you follow the code. Like, it's simple. But I think, unfortunately, we're not there. You know, mm -hmm. and it is all of us that have responsibility to do this. Um, but I just want to pause here for a second before I continue with the questions to say I always use the example of uh, a naughty child's parent. When you have the parents' evening, 
you'll find the children who are doing really well, all their parents tend to attend the session. And most times the teacher is waiting for this naughty child's parent to talk to, and they are the ones who don't necessarily come. So I'm quite confident that the 240 odd people on this call right now are probably people who don't even necessarily need to listen to this and are trying to be part of the solution. So again, a warm welcome to all these candidates to try and help people like me and you have this discussion to try and move this country forward. So on that note, I'm gonna read a few questions at a time because there seems to be a slight buildup of questions. Um, so the next one is by Coogan Play. And he says, thanks Akani for the enlightening lecture. You spoke about collective action. How do we address acting and deciding as a collective? When the very same collective leadership was protecting and shielding those implicated in the nine years of state capture and benefited from the proceeds of corruption. Hmm. You know, Kugan, I look at this and I consider what has happened in recent years and months. If I look at the notion that the Zondo Commission reports are now out, the challenge for all of us is to ensure that the appropriate corrective action is then taken. Um, I, I take some inspiration from what we saw when we did the COVID-19 audits. In the middle of lockdown, as I said, we, we did these real-time audits and we looked at all of the initiatives and some dealt with PPE, others dealt with what was happening at the UIF and others of Exasa and a great many other areas. Government set out the Fusion Center which was driving collaboration across the public institutions that are charged with law enforcement and with investigations. When we finished our audits and we were able to do them, you know, three months apart, so three months of transactions and then we audited, we were able to give that information to the Fusion Center. Part of that, the component parts of the Fusion Center then took on their own responsibilities. So you saw some of the investigations being taken up by the SIU, and you're seeing action following. Some of the things maybe we've forgotten is that still in 2020, we did the work at UIF and we flagged transactions that were clearly fraudulent, but someone else had to go and investigate to confirm. Before the year ended, so really within eight months, you saw people in the dark. You saw people being charged with fraud for having attempted to, to defraud the scheme. You saw that at SASA as well. You also saw money being paid back to the UIF. Billions went back to the UIF because we'd done our work and there was responsiveness in the system and there was collaboration by all the actors, starting with the leadership of the entity as well as the leadership of the investigative bodies. You also saw that within the context of UIF, when we had issued findings around people who benefited inappropriately, the money came back and the instances of inappropriate payments diminished when we did the second tranche of audits. When we flagged invalid rejections of benefits where an, uh, uh, an intended beneficiary did not get the benefit because of some or other controls issue, that was corrected. So people who should have benefited got what they needed and going forward, the errors were diminished. So in a very short space of time, and I take immense inspiration from this, in a very short space of time, we saw the things we want, which is that, sure, the world's not always going to be perfect, but when something has been flagged as being wrong, fix it. Make sure people who should get a benefit get it. Make sure those who didn't deserve a benefit pay it back, and make sure those that are involved in criminality are then held accountable by law enforcement. That's what we all should be crying for. So I take immense inspiration from what we've seen in the recent past. What we've got to insist on is that this pace um, is, is picked up significantly and this trend continues where we have consequences and corrective action being the norm. Thanks, Akani. Then Kensani Balo is asking an interesting question to say what exactly are the implications 
of the certificate of debt for a public entity. You mentioned that you'll be able to issue that with the new regulations and you're almost ready to issue uh, if you don't come right with the examples you quoted. So a certificate of debt is actually issued in the name of the accounting officer uh, because the, the Public Audit Act really positions the office of the AG as auditing the activities, the leadership of the accounting officer that is the appointed steward over a public institution. The PFMA gives significant responsibilities and authority to the accounting officer. So when we audit, you'll see there are our engagement letter is directed at them, our management report is directed at them. So when we've got these findings, it's out. we've got to flag them and get them to correct. So we then go through the journey of referrals, recommendation, remedial action, and eventually a certificate of debt. That doesn't go to the institution, it goes to the individual. The one whom we are holding accountable for their failure to act in accordance with their legislative duties. So that's how it's been designed. It is quite punitive in the hands of the accounting officer. And ideally we shouldn't celebrate the certificate of debt because by the time you get to a certificate of debt, you've gone through all of these processes on that down and time has gone. But also you've missed so many different opportunities to fix the problem. And I think that's the thing we should be worried about. So I, I often say to people, you know, if you see an, the AG issuing a certificate of debt, you should understand that there has been failure across multiple levels. Repeated failure on the part of the accounting officer, failure on the part of the person that supervises and monitors them, and that would be the minister, the MEC, the mayor, and even failure on the oversight machinery. So that would be the council, that would be the provincial legislature, that would be parliament, because they're supposed to hold them accountable. So outside of the AG, throughout that whole journey, somebody else should be acting. And when they have failed, then we issue the certificate of debt. So I've, I've left out how it comes about, whom it affects, but also I've highlighted that that should not be our target. Um, the good thing, when I said, so I, when I talked about the, the COD, the certificate of debt, I mentioned that in a great many instances, we are finding that accounting officers respond to our material irregularities notifications. I'll give you two examples. You would have noticed um, about three weeks ago that one of the municipalities in KZN had a, um, a celebratory social media post about how they now have a qualified audit. And I know people lampoon them and all of that. And, and yes, I agree, a qualified audit is not something to really get too excited about. But here's the backstory. This municipality, and it's a district municipality, so it's not that difficult to get their financials right. They had a repeat disclaimer. So a disclaimer of audit opinion for many, many, many years. And so when we audited with them for the 2021 financial year, we then said, no man, you can't just issue another disclaimer. Let's problematize this thing because it's, you know, it's intolerable that, that a municipality just can't put a cash book together. I mean, that's how bad things are, right? So that's what we said. So we said, okay, we are going to issue a material irregularity because the law says the municipal manager has a responsibility to maintain a, a credible set of financials and maintain financial records. So the fact that there's a, there's a, a, a disclaimer of audit opinion says that the financial records are in disarray and therefore says that accounting officer has not complied with their duty in law. So we issued an MI. And out of that, that municipality for the first time actually attended to their financials. And they, they were able to submit financials and through the audit process, they move from disclaimer through adverse and into qualified. Surely I agree that journey is not complete. There's a lot more work still to be done, but there is some good news because it says, well, first of all, the thing we were insisting on is not impossible. It also says that at least now they're responding. Um, another example is that when we first did these uh, MIs, there was a particular ODT, one of the departments in the Eastern Cape, 
And one of the material irregularities we issued related to a grader that had gone missing. And this grader had gone missing because they had left it parked in somebody's yard with the keys inside. And of course, the very next day, this thing had now left the, the country to even cross the border because by the time we flagged the, the issue, the grader had gone. So we problematized it by saying, you know, yes, you've lost an asset and we can register a loss on the record. But more importantly, this asset is meant to deliver services and make the lives of the people in that area better. And the fact that you're not doing it is actually causing harm. So we issued the MRI and we insisted that there must be corrective action. And over a few months, the grader was back. So the grader is back doing what it's supposed to do. Now in those two instances, you won't see a certificate of debt, but you do see corrective action. And you might think these are light examples, but for us, there are reminders that, as I say, the things we insist on are not impossible. They are genuinely doable. And, and certainly that there is some responsiveness in the system. <laughs> No, that's actually great examples because I also saw that social media feed and I also thought, how can somebody be excited about a qualified report? But now that you've given context, it actually makes sense. Um, so there's a question by Dr. Shashi Kassan. Uh, he said that CPD is a requirement for most professionals and should it not be extended to all public offices, including politicians? And then he further notes that should it not actually be mandatory for anyone that's holding some type of public post or a responsible post? Um, the short answer is absolutely. And the good thing is we're seeing that the National School of Government, which was designed to do just that, has been more active in, in the last year or so than we'd seen it for a long time. So, so I believe that if, if this trend continues, you know, you'll get to a point where CPD becomes the norm. And that's really quite important. And I, I've really drawn some inspiration from seeing how, as I say, the National School of Government has hearkened to the core. Excellent. So I'm going to combine two questions. One is from Dalpat. It says, who's checking up on the CFOs and CEOs of the public sector? And we've indirectly spoken about this around capabilities and all of that. But then, Aswin Takazi says, why is corruption depicted as something that is inherent in every government? Is this because the internal controls of government are weak or is it that government hiring people who are just not competent? So I think we're coming back to that slight discussion, you know, about, I think also Sakani, it's become like a cultural thing that if you are aligned to the code, there's something wrong. Why are you not being corrupt? You know, it's become mm. a culture that corruption is inherent, as, as Winter Kazi is mentioning. So mm. let me pause there and maybe if you want to make a comment, but I think they all link to a lot of what we've discussed already. But if mm -hmm. you want to add anything to it. No, thanks, Prof. Um, I, I do believe that we've got to strengthen controls. We've got to improve competence. And, and where things go wrong, we've got to act swiftly. Um, because sometimes it's a discipline issue, sometimes it's a training issue, and sometimes it's a matter of criminality. In any of those instances, if we act swiftly, then you change the culture because you, you move from a culture that tolerates poor performance and transgressions to one that doesn't tolerate that, and that's what you want. Um, so I, I do think that you've got to have a strong set of controls that helps you detect problems and you've got to have the discipline of acting on those problems. Well, there's an anonymous question actually that also says that, is it possible for you to clarify about the Limpopo Department of Health? Because the SIU has also outlined several PPE charges on six senior officials, but nothing has been done till today. The challenges in is that those officials are still authorizing documents despite the alleged charges. So has, this, has there been anything done on this Limpopo incident? And I think again, Sakani, it links to if people are incompetent or um, you know, being corrupt, then 
you know, to what extent do they still continue in that role as well until there's actually some outcome or charges? Mm. I think at the end of the day, we've got to insist on competence, on ethical conduct, and we've got to insist that when things go wrong, there, there is swift, a swift set of consequences being meted out. So I'm unable to comment in specific terms on, on Limpopo's uh, health department, but I think the principle would still stand that where there has been uh, an audit issue or a matter that needs investigation, we must investigate it swiftly and act on it so that um, you know, those who've done wrong are corrected and held accountable. Um, and and you, you, you don't create, as I say, this tolerance for, for transgressions from what has been said as the norm. Thank you. So I think the next question is actually directed at me, even though the questions are all meant to be directed at you. So the question reads, as professionals, who are implicated in state capture, auditors and lawyers, among others, what are the lessons for academic institutions like WITS who train these professionals? So I think, Coogan, on that, as we said earlier, you know, we teach and preach ethics. And I think what I'd like to share very quickly is we experienced during COVID uh, with going with emergency online, the level of cheating from students. And we didn't sort of stand by and let it just happen. And you'd be amazed at the level and type of cheating uh, within the school. So we really took them all to task. And I'm not yet able to disclose the detail, but I can disclose that one student actually got expelled at the end of it. And many students actually acknowledged and confessed that they cheated and literally got a zero for that exam and needed to most times then repeat the year. So we also are experiencing, you know, within the academic institutions such challenges, especially with COVID as well. And I absolutely agree, Kugan, that it's our responsibility equally. And like Sakani said, you know, it's all of us collective, you know, the word collective I think is important. Um, and then another one, Sakani, is, is there significance to the CFOs being registered accountants in fostering accountability and ethical leadership? I do think having CFOs that are members of professional bodies is a game changer because then you have another layer that's going to drive competence and, and continued com competence, another layer that's going to deal with the environmental stuff in terms of advocacy for the type of environment where their, their members operate. And as I said, there's another layer that's going to deal with discipline and conduct. Um, you know, somebody once said to me, when, when you've got to an additional layer beyond employer employee, when you've got an additional layer around the professional body, it does put greater responsibility on that individual to behave properly because they know that it's not just losing this job, but it's losing their license to earn a living. And so if you've got that additional layer, I think it, it is a game changer. It can certainly help to um, shift the culture, um, shift the tendency to do wrong or to allow wrongdoing to happen under our watch towards less tolerance. for that. Yeah. And Sakani, I think the next question is in a way linked, uh, where it says, is it, so we've spoken about if the CFO is also, you know, linked to a professional body, but then the a question by Imbazima is that, is it possible that the lack of professionalism and competency of managers is as a result of there being political authority who actually dictates in the background uh, who some of these appointments should really be, regardless of them not having the necessary skills. Mm. So again, if, if you're a professional, you're not going to be too quick to take a role that you don't deserve. You're going to be worried about, um, do you care? You're going to be worried about your responsibility to maintain your own reputation as a professional because 
if you do well in one role, your bet your your chances of moving on are, are just great better enhanced. So I do think once again that if you're able to professionalize the the way that managers of key functions in government are, are the way that they are appointed and the way that they are managed, if you're able to do that, then you 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 really are going to push back on the tendency for inappropriate interference by politicians. Yeah, thanks Akani. Um, and then I know we almost time Heather, but if you give us two more minutes, I think everyone wants to have their questions answered and we're nearly there with the questions. So if everyone can allow me just two or three more minutes, that would be great. Uh, so Shashikan's come back around, he mentioned about the CPD, and now he's saying, obviously, all the public officers, you know, they have the oath that they take, and uh, is it not maybe a suggestion that they need to retake that oath? I would add to his point uh, more regularly and have like a recommitment to what they've really committed to. Yeah, need to go and re renew, renew their vows. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think more than anything, it's also about the type of conversations that I had amongst those appointed public officials, um, either through the, the professional development that continues to equip them, to equip the, their responsibilities appropriately, um, or other mechanisms. So, you know, even more than taking the oath again, but more about a continued effort to equip people to do their work. Yeah. So I think there's a few more questions, but I'm just going to sort of sum them up slightly. And I think the theme of the questions is really once again around chain supply, supply chain around, you know, not, um, you know, is the, the one question is, is there correlation between a clean audit and the service delivery. And then other questions are around, can you really teach ethics, you know? And so I think uh, Sakani, what I'm going to ask is because we're running out of time, I think whenever we have these discussions, we always run out of time because everyone wants to know what else. So I would actually like for you to maybe um, sum up for us that essentially what has come through is mm. what can we do around the corruption, around the supply chain management, et cetera, and how can we minimize uh, the political mm. influence? Yeah. No, thanks, Prof. And, and thanks again for the opportunity to talk to, to Vizzy in this way. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I'll wrap up by saying that the only way we're going to insulate our country, our public administration um, from, from wrongdoing is, is by building strong institutions. And the way you build strong institutions in our view is by ensuring that they're led by capable leaders, people with integrity, people with competence, and, and, and people who um, have understood their duty to serve. And regardless of where they sit, if they're in the political realm, then they've got to make sure that they are ethical, they're equipped to do their work around oversight, and they hold management accountable. And they appoint the type of management that is professional, and the type of management that will be held accountable. Um, that's how you're going to build strength. And it's not going to happen overnight. An audit, one year's audit is not going to shift the, the, the strength of an institution. It's an ongoing discussion, an ongoing effort on improvement. And clean audit um, is a, a, an important indicator on whether or not the pillars for performance, accountability, and transparency are there. It doesn't mean necessarily that there has been performance in the way that's expected, but certainly you have information at your fingertips that tells you whether or not you can rely on what you have and whether or not there has been performance and you can interpret it for yourself. As the audit office, we want to continue to sharpen how we audit so that we can give you richer insights as the users of our work, but also we accept that we can't answer the full story around how you build public institutions. It's going to take all of us in our different roles to keep focusing on building public institutions that have strength 
and they have integrity. That's the only way we're going to safeguard our, our public administration and ultimately our democracy. Thanks so much, Sakani. And I would also like to make a few closing remarks to firstly thank you for your full participation with so much of passion. And I think all of us on this call actually admire your strength and wish you that you can do what you need to do in order to help us you know, make this country better. You have all our support and anything you need from us, please do reach out. And to all the participants, I'm going to take the liberty to say, if you want to give the Auditor General any comments, any questions, any support, any ideas on how things can work better, please do feel free. So without getting her permission, I'm going ahead and giving you the permission to contact her if need be. And yeah, so I think definitely very inspiring. And I think we're gonna need a second session on this. There's still been many unanswered questions and things that even I wanted to touch on, which I basically didn't get to ask any of my questions. So on that note, uh, thank you to all the participants and thank you to Auditor General for participating in this webinar with us. And thanks to the WITS team, the Centenary Campaign team to put this together as well. So from all of us, have a wonderful evening and I'm sure we will be seeing you soon and engaging with you further. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay.